So f f thank you uh, everybody to be uh, to be connected, uh, Professor, uh, professor uh, to be here today. So um, I, I will uh, I will give you the mic uh, very quickly for this uh, uh, this fifth webinar about urban experimentation uh, for the people who are in connected. So the the, the, present the presentation is recorded and will be uh, put in, in 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 internet in the website of uh, of the of the Fondation France Japon of EHSS. So welcome. I'm uh, Sebastian, and I, I give you the give you the talk now. For the people in, in connected, you you can put your question at uh, uh, of this session, and at the end of the presentation, I will give the question to to professor to the professor, and and he, he will answer to to your, to to your question. Thank you uh, for for being here today, and uh, have a good talk. Thank you, uh, thank you, Alexandre. Uh, Welcome everybody. For for those of you who are in the in the virtual room, thank you very much for inviting me to give uh, to give this talk. And remotely, uh, under still somewhat complicated circumstances with lockdown with COVID, I hope all of you are fine. I also recognize that the situation of scheduling things and then um, schedule, scheduling routines are quite difficult. Um, it's the same in Munich. It's the same, uh, I guess, in most places around the world that the regular academic routines of um, of academic exchange or intellectual exchange are um, all a little bit more more difficult. Um, nevertheless, I'm very happy to be able to present to you today um, a, some work that uh, goes a few years back, but also extends in the future, and that uh, taps into um, uh, into various uh, themes related to experimental urbanism. Um, but gets at it more from a, um, I would say, technology and innovation perspective, which um, might provide us some complementary perspectives to the other talks that you've been hearing in the series over the last um, weeks, months, and so on. Um, my name is uh, Sebastian Fotenhauer. I am a professor of innovation research and STS scholar, science technology um, studies scholar. And I'm the co-director of uh, a center called Munich Center for Technology and Society at Technical University Munich. Um, where I had uh, the Innovation Society Public Policy Group um, in the next 35 to 45 minutes. What's a, what I would like to do is to um, take the opportunity um, of giving a virtual presentation at OHSS um, in France uh, to, to say a few, few words first about our center and our uh, sort of my group's research agenda and then focus on, um, on the core of this paper, or of, of the core of this presentation, which has to do with testing future societies and social technical transformation. That's something that has partly been published and partly will um, is sort of uh, is continuing to be uh, uh, in forthcoming pub publications. And then I'll, uh, and I'll focus specifically on um, certain tensions and certain ways of conceptualizing what's going on in these so-called living labs and test beds uh, from an innovation perspective. Um, and then I'll say a few words towards the end about uh, future research directions, what this might have to do with the governance, um, uh, governance questions of innovation, experimental interventions, legal questions that arise, uh, questions of scalability, um, so notions of how a social, social technical transformation scale uh, and maybe a few words about experimental territories. All right, um, with that, let me begin right away. Um, so uh, a few words about where I'm speaking from. So I'm located in Munich um, at a technical university. So um, the vast majority of my colleagues here are um, engineers, natural scientists. And we, as the social scientists, are um, a relatively young crowd. Um, we, the, the Munich Center for Technology and Society, which I'm currently co-heading, um, was launched in 2015 as part of a future concept for the university with which it entered into the federal, uh, federal competition. You might have heard about this German Excellence Initiative or not. Uh, if, if you haven't, it uh, doesn't matter. Um, but it was a, a very conscious move by the Technical University of Munich to reposition social sciences, if you will, at the heart of um, the value proposition of technical universities. And since then, they've actually grown quite considerably from, um, well, initially something like four to six um, professors, uh, 
to a number of different divisions. We are now about 25, and it's uh, if the plans hold, then there will be about 80 professorships within the next five years um, to to really rethink what universities, technical universities, should do in the 21st century. Um, our center itself has about eight professorships and two research uh, junior research groups. We're about 70 people. Um, we host two master's programs and one PhD program. And all of this is sort of at the intersection of societal challenges, social change um, as part in tech of technical context. What do I do? What does my research group um, do in particular? Um, so my, um, I would usually the way how I frame the bigger research program behind what I behind what I'm doing is with asking what is good innovation um, and that goes beyond more traditional question of sort of just asking what is innovation or how can we get more innovation which is typical at technical universities um, but sort of asking um, what do we mean what do communities mean what do uh, what do communities of practice mean when they say they they want something from innovation ideally in, to, something better a better living a better world from innovation and so this um, requires sort of a reflexive a situated um, and constructive constructivist perspective and the types of question that i ask are clustered around first sort of innovation instruments and policies um, so what what uh, what can we do to align innovation policies better with social needs and preferences and how can we inno uh, how, how can we innovate responsibly opening with room for dissent and questions of experimentation and scale figure into this in part because um, these are uh, very prominent innovation instruments at the moment um, and uh, sort of uh, receive a lot of attention so for me it's interesting to understand what exactly these instruments do and how they interact with um, with places with societies. The second strand of my work has to do with uh, what I would call regional innovation cultures, um, and that means basically asking um, how do the visions behind innovation, how do practices of innovation differ across sites and different technology domains, and how does innovation and social technical change relate to identities, um, social economic legacies, political cultures. And the third part um, is basically trans, uh, sort of transnational governance of science and innovation. Um, how do we, uh, how do innovation ideas and models emerge and circulate? So I've worked a lot on questions of how the Silicon Valley model or the MIT model have circulated around the world. Um, how do we govern emerging technologies and what, what, how do political and um, scientific integration, for example, in Europe, go hand in hand. So these are sort of the general research directions. With that, let me wrap up this part of a broader context and um, really go into the presentation, um, into the research part of the webinar of the talk. Now, um, the title of the talk, a um, little bit hubristically, is called um, Testing Future Societies? Question um, mark. Developing a framework for test beds and living limits of instruments of innovation governance. Um, I'll, we'll see in a second what that means. But to start us off with, so what are, what do I mean when I say living limits or test beds? What are these things and why should we care? Um, so I, I guess many of you um, who are working in urban contexts or are interested in these kinds of things. Um, uh, w will know something about this, about living labs or test bed, but maybe in a nutshell, um, test beds and living labs have emerged as a kind of prominent innovation instrument used by all kinds of actors, used by governments, by companies, by research institutions um, to foster innovation and social transformation processes. And um, the idea is basically that you can uh, define designated experimental spaces where certain technologies, transformative technologies, can be tested under real world conditions and ideally with the participation of the public or of other actors, um, whether voluntarily or involuntarily. And frequently um, this is done in conjunction with a local reduction of regulatory constraints, so lo lowering regulation in order to enable technology testing. Um, so I guess the most uh, uh, one of the most prominent examples at the, at this moment is um, autonomous driving or self-driving cars. And just imagine 
all the range of questions that emerge when suddenly self-driving cars show up in your neighborhood. Um, so these living labs and test beds are prominent in part because they are uh, they they tap into these grand societal challenges discourses um, and sort of promise that we can somehow deal with technical change and social social change at the same time and that we also need places to try these things out to see if they work to learn from mistakes um, to see if we like what what happens um, or and ideally um, if we don't like what we see we should be able to um, go in, in different directions, but as we'll see later, um, this is not quite uh, true. Very often it leads to lock-in and sort of performative dimensions. Um, many of these assumptions are, um, are uh, in a way highly problematic. But the, the basic value proposition of these living labs and test beds is that they are seen as kind of launch pads for broader systemic change uh, and also as a kind of way to steer innovation in desirable directions. Now, whenever I give this talk or a similar talk, um, it's it's very curious um, for me coming out of an innovation SDS context to talk when I talk to urban plan uh, to uh, scholars from urban studies and planning, because in a way this idea of urban laboratories um, has a much longer tradition, um, maybe not longer, but has much more scholarship and more analysis um, already in in the context of urban studies and planning. Uh, the, the, the idea of cities as laboratories and cities as field sites, um, what Thomas Gearin called the city as truth spots, it goes back into, well, for a long time into urban planning, um, but also into the work of Chicago School of Urban Studies. Um, the uh, notions of um, well, planning and um, notions of modernism, high modernism control, technocratic pro projects, so all the work that uh, people like James Scott have um, have looked at, and that, nevertheless, there is a little bit of a renewed interest in the sort of living lab urbanism, experimental urbanism work by uh, Andrew Carvonen and others. Um, I say this as a kind of preface because I know that many of you might have, uh, for many of you, some of the things I'm going to say might be trivial, but it's worth pointing out that from an innovation perspective, from an engineering perspective, we come from a slightly different trajectory. So this embedding in urban contexts. Um, is has a has a history, but it's not. It doesn't come as natural. So usually, the idea of living labs or test beds really comes from engineering. Comes out of the idea of beta testing or real world testing of new technologies. So really, test beds having a, a race track where you can test a new car, kind of thing. Um, you have uh, and this then go, raises questions that relate to sociology of testing, um, questions of new risks, so risk society, questions of open innovation and co-creation, and so and so on. So in a way, this is a neat neat juncture today, where um, where we see questions of urban planning increasingly entangled with questions of technology development, and almost in a way where tech developers are saying we need these cities in order to develop our technologies. We need urban spaces. Without that, we cannot develop the next, uh, the next technological proposition. Now, um, before, so this was a long introduction. I'm going to do something um, that one perhaps shouldn't do, but I'm going to give you some of the, uh, what maybe the key message of the presentation up front, which is, um, so from an innovation perspective, what living labs typically propose is we test and improve technologies in society, in real world context. And what I'm going to suggest, and again, that's uh, in a way, it's very, uh, uh, it, it's not profound magic. We can learn a lot by flipping this specific perspective around and, and, uh, and ask, so, if we want to understand what the transformative power of uh, of these living labs are and what they do to society, and it makes sense to shift from the perspective of testing technologies in society to testing um, future envisioned societies against a, a new set of technological premises or and associated modes of governance. So testing society against new technologies as opposed to or symmetrically to testing technologies in society. And this kind of co-productionist perspective um, allows us to look at questions of stabilization and looks, look, allows us to look at questions of, uh, of challenges in a, more, um, in, a, in a more profound way. 
All right, so let's get started with some of the um, some of the meat. Um, so this is um, a very famous or infamous example that many of you might know. Um, this is uh, Toronto, and in May 2020, the city of Toronto and a company called Sidewalk Labs, which is a startup under Google's parent company Alphabet, so a sister company of Google, um, declared that uh, a very ambitious redevelopment project of Toronto's waterfront, um, a, a, test, a, a living lab kind of approach, um, was dead and they are pulling out of it. So this was in 2020 and it was less than three years after this project was launched with a lot of public attention. Um, so it's because it's infamous because it's been accompanied by major controversies all along the way and many people in the innovation space and also in the urban planning space point to this as a kind of reference for uh, how things can go wrong and why it's so tricky um, to think about these um, living labs in the first place. Um, but uh, to sort of chronologically, um, in 2017, um, this Sidewalk Labs announced that they wanted to develop Toronto's waterfront district into a quote-unquote proving ground for technology-enabled urban environments around the world, so with a scalability ambition. Um, and for Alphabet and for Google, this effort was the next logical step to what they call reimagining cities from the internet up. Um, the, the company CEO, um, Dan Doktorov, um, emphasized that Toronto will have to and de facto agree to, to waive or exempt many existing regulations, for example, in building codes, transportation and energy and so on. Um, so lower regulation to make this possible. And the Prime Minister of Canada, Justin Trudeau, um, heralded this project as a kind of testbed for new technologies that will help us build cleaner, smarter, greener cities. Now, um, this was, it's one of many initiatives around the world, but from the beginning, really, this ha it has been embroiled in controversies about privacy and, uh, and digital surveillance, um, surveillance capitalism, about questions of inequality, about questions of local disenfranchisement, about the sellout of public spaces to companies, um, about a lack of diversity in leadership. Many prominent um, advisory board members or members stepped down. Um, one of the uh, advisory board members from the beginning, um, Sadia Musafar, said, uh, sort of stepped down very publicly, noting that the question is not how we can build a better monopoly tech led company, uh, a, a monopoly tech company led surveillance based city, but that we have enough evidence that we don't want to build that at all. And as the only person of color on a panel representing, uh, representing public interest for diverse Toronto, I resign with a heavy heart. Um, and the former CEO of BlackBerry, which was a Canadian company, or is a Canadian company, um, and uh, he's sort of the Mr. Innovation in Canada in many ways, uh, noted that this is the shutting down of this project is a big step um, back for surveillance capitalism and the victory for making technology serve society rather than capture it. And Google learned that Canadians cannot easily be bullied. So in a nutshell, you see sort of the range of controversies that are embroiled in these kinds of initiatives and the questions that they raise. And this, this experience is perhaps more visible than others, but it's not atypical. I think these questions exist in many different places. Now, Obviously, Sidewalk Labs and Waterfront Toronto are uh, not the only examples and the only types of technologies. Basically, around the world, um, you, uh, you have these testbed initiatives popping up. Um, some of the more prominent examples, at least from where uh, the types of work that I do, um, the autonomous driving uh, in um, happening all around the world, but uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, um, a couple of years ago, there was a fatal accident between a self-driving Uber vehicle and a woman walking her bike, um, and this sort of created a lot of uh, triggered a lot of controversy again around how they these vehicles are exactly are being introduced and tested on streets. In Berlin, there's a um, big controversy going on around facial recognition testing at certain train stations at the moment. Uh, Mazdar City was a major redevelopment plant in, uh, in the United Arab uh, Emirates uh, where it's basically reinventing or re-envisioning living in a desert together with new mobility and energy and housing technologies, basically planning a city in the middle of the desert. 
uh, robotics labs, um, home robotics or um, uh, social robotics uh, or public uh, or healthcare robotics is a big thing and how they are tested in various standardized apartments around the world. Singapore, one of the most aggressive places to use these kinds of uh, to use these kinds of uh, questions, um, the regulatory sandbox, for example, in terms of finance, and then also um, quite well disconcerting initiatives in uh, in potential testing of uh, of germline edited um, or germline modified uh, mos mosquitoes, um, the local release in places like such as Burkina Faso in Brazil to eradicate malaria, see if, um, if mosquitoes get, uh, get genetically modified, if we can drive through a gene drive, can drive out malaria and see if there's a, uh, there are local differences in, uh, in these technologically modified mosquitoes vis-a-vis -vis other regions. Now, this is just to say that these things are everywhere. Um, and again, sort of our focus here is um, the ways in which these living labs make social order explicitly available for experimentation, um, a way of testing new technologies under the assumption that certain innovations have already happened and that we have as societies accepted them somehow in local spaces, however tentatively, um, which breaks with traditional understandings of lab to market innovation processes. Um, it, um, it sort of, it rethinks innovation not so much as a located sort of in the garage or in the small in the confined lab process but something that's happening as part of social order and at a meso scale and usually by defining certain areas or test populations which is very different from what traditionally you saw um at least well uh, in in some ways it's uh, it's quite different together with the local alteration of laws and regulations um, and this idea that we have a transformative uh, that we have a broader transformation coming out of this so the key the questions again are not very surprising so if we shift this perspective from testing technologies to really testing technology uh, testing societies um, and what's going on and questions that are of interest are what kind of futures are being enabled or disabled uh, who's interested, uh, whose interests are represented in these micro societies? What is the constitutional and performative function um, of such living labs? What kind of futures do they constitute and how do they perform these futures um, to stabilize? Who gets to legitimize model societies? Um, how do we handle these ambitions of scale? What happens if real world testing becomes sort of the a ubiquitous model of innovation? Uh, what what does this say about the spatial foundations of social technical change um, and what are sort of the legal and governance ramifications and are there ways of using this maybe not just as a way to drive out more in or to drive more innovation with low regulation but actually as a way of developing better regulation in tandem so this is something um, that we're that I'm gonna get back to towards the end um, in our work, and now I'm going to get more into um, into the empirical detail and the cases that I'm going to look at. Um, again, a little bit upfront, um, three. We observe three tensions, or sort of narrated tensions, that test beds that people working or actors in test beds deal with, or um, sort of speak to and try to wrestle with. And for us, these have been quite interesting. Um, ways of conceptualizing or cutting through empirical material and trying to understand sort of what's going on and what how this helps us answer these more tri these trickier questions. And again, some of this is uh, this that isn't necessarily surprising, but one of the tensions that actors tend to narrate um, or tend to point to are um, in different visions behind um, what these things are supposed uh, these living labs are supposed to do. So one tension is between what we might call a paradigm of controlled experimentation versus a paradigm of sort of messy, random, overflowing innovation, uh, overflowing in the Calon, Calon sense, um, the sort of co-creative co paradigms of innovation. And so on the one hand, you imagine these living labs as designated so zones where engineers can have control over parameters and move things in a way to optimize technology, let's put it like that. 
And on the other hand, uh, you do want to have what, a real world context. So you do want to have these random interactions as part of the innovation processes. And so how do you get these two together? The second one, again, uh, not a huge surprise, is uh, the relationship between scientific testing and public demonstration efforts. And a sort of sociology of testing tells us that these things are ultimately always related. Um, but nevertheless, there is sort of a, a different emphasis depending on who you ask on whether this is really there to develop and test technologies or whether this is really there to showcase that a technology and a social model is working. And the, th uh, and the third one has to do with local specificity versus scalability and transferability. So how much is a living lab supposed to be context sensitive to the specific local situation versus how much is it envisioned to provide a role model or a template for broader rollout in other places from the beginning? And there's a sort of trade-off or tension there. This is not to say that um, this is not a typology of test beds. It's more to, it's a sort of productive tensions that the that actors work with um, or deal with and find solutions in their own way that help us understand what exactly they try to achieve when they when when they work with living labs and test beds. I'm going to skip theory a little bit, but let me just say that the cases that we look at are part of a larger European. Um, Horizon 2020 project that um, I happen to be the coordinator of. It's called Scalings, um, Scaling Up Co-Creation, um, Avenues and Limits for Integrating Society in, uh, in Science and Innovation. And basically what this larger project is, it's a comparative study of certain open or co-creative co innovation practices in 10 different countries and in three different technology domains. Um, so we look at 10 countries, uh, at robotics, at urban energy systems, and at autonomous vehicles. And one of the particular instruments that we're interested in are test beds and living labs. And so this is sort of a part, a part of that case study, a part of what I'm gonna present now um, is sort of a subset of cases from, from this broader array of, um, of living labs and other innovation instruments that we are looking at. So um, this is going to be relatively quickly, I would say, I'm not going to go into, well, I'm going to go into some depth, but uh, we can talk more in the Q&A if you want to hear about this. But, so the two cases that I want to talk about um, are uh, two energy living labs, so energy transformation living labs, primarily, there are also some other technologies, but uh, both in Germany, uh, one in the city of Berlin, um, an urban campus called the Euref Euref Campus, um, meaning uh, short. It's short for European Energy Forum. Um, very urban setting, and the other one is just a hundred kilometers south uh, west, uh, but in a very different rural setting. Regional network. Uh, it's sort of a. It's called EAA Energy Avantgarde Anhalt, um, and it's sort of a regional network approach. Uh, also a living lab. And, uh, this is based on um, the work by one PhD student in particular and some other, uh, myself and a couple of others as well, um, based on three years of ethnographic graphic field work, um, interviews, and policy analysis, and sort of participant observation um, of this PhD student being involved in these projects. All right, so let's take a quick deep dive into these projects, and I'm just going to flag a few elements that are interesting about them. Um, so this is the case study number one, um, EUREF, the European Energy Forum. Um, it's a campus, a research campus that is located within Berlin in the Tempelhof Schöneberg district. Um, it's a self-proclaimed urban, urban living lab for the Energiewende, um, the German flagship and federal flagship initiative for energy transitions. And it has received considerable public funding and attracted many startups, um, companies, and about, today there are about two and a half thousand engineers and office workers in this kind of five hectare area. So you can see from the pictures, it's very sort of brick and mortar, kind of hipster, kind of uh, sort of old retro, new glitzy kind of innovation, urban uh, and urban design. Um, it's located on a, on, a, on the facility of a former gas storage. Uh, Gas, uh, on the premises of a former gas storage facility that's um, that's here, this uh, 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 this building. Um, it's a cultural heritage site that was purchased by an investor. 
um, and has become sort of a go-to initiative for energy for the integration of energy mobility and building technologies um, that tries to put side by side electric vehicles, charging station, wind turbines, uh, solar panels, biogas, cogeneration, micro smart grids, and so on and so on. So, what kind of society are we testing here? Um, it's a kind of future urban society um, enmeshed with new forms of energy, mobility, and IT. It's a highly cosmopolitan, high-tech vision, um, sort of an edgy, artsy, integrated Berlin vision. It's blended technology creation and use. So it's a research campus that is also that ought to be representative, representative of the energy needs and the housing needs and the working needs of Berlin. So it's a research campus, but it's a kind of envisioned as a demonstration space on privately owned ground. Um, and it's a private sector vision um, because it's when it's owned by an investor and it's focused uh, a, lot, a lot on businesses and entrepreneurs. So what does this mean for um, the three tensions and how can they help us understand what's going on here? Um, so the, uh, oh, let me just take this successively. So in a way, um, in the, the, the tension between control and messiness, um, UREF in a way is quite highly controlled. It's a privately owned campus, so it's not public space, it's private space, and it's literally fenced off from its Berlin neighborhoods. Um, so you have to enter through a gate in order to get onto the campus. So it's a very controlled arrangement, um, for example, where you can put certain things, rebuild certain things, um, charging stations and so on, which allows for quite a bit of regulatory and institutional flexibility. And it's so it sort of embraces this mode, it quite strongly embraces this mode of quasi-scientific testing for and with engineers uh, with okay, potentially radical new concepts. But a big complication in this is that um, by fencing it off from Berlin, of course, um, you are losing a lot of the sort of random interactions. So in fact, um, there is very little public random encounters. It's quite isolated. The citizens around this have occasionally referred to as a UFO, something that just landed in Berlin and has nothing to do with Berlin. Um, and it's a kind of, uh, it's in a way, uh, trying to become a model for Berlin without actually interfering with Berlin or integrating with Berlin. And a second complication is that um, since there, uh, I mean, the, the heterogeneous groups on the uh, on the uh, on this campus um, have led, uh, the, well, regular end up in conflicts on uh, on whose projects or visions are should be tested or receive pr uh, receive priority. Um, and as one one engineer said, so a lot can change very quickly. Infrastructural assumptions on which we base our planning and engineering can can over can be overturned completely. And on the one hand, this is um, the charm of the campus. And on the but on the other hand, it makes it makes any straightforward approach to innovation impossible and requires us to be constantly flexible and adaptive. So even within this confined space, the differences between the uh, between the various actors. Um, regularly lead to conflict as to what kind of vision is actually being tested. Um, there's also, uh, along these other lines, um, may, uh, uh, one thing that stood out, or two, th two more things that stood out is um, engineers do appreciate the amount of flexibility, e experimental flexibility and control, and yet over time the campus has really moved into a sort of a demonstration mindset, meaning um, the uh, because it's so prominent with policymakers and with companies, um, there is a sort of a constant flow of delegations or visitors to this campus, uh, campus official visitors, and in a way, um, many have noted, many who work on the campus, that it's uh, it's become much more about stage demonstrations of technology superiority, of how great Germany is doing with renewable energy um, uh, technologies, and so this has led to a um, as some have, local actors have observed, the tension between sort of open-endedness of really trying to experiment and um, a sort of quick closure of experiments vis-a-vis -vis global competitive global pressures um, and taking out the most risky projects. Um, and again, this is not terribly surprising, but it's something that we uh, that we uh, that we observe there as well as other places. And then maybe the last thing I'm going to mention about this case study is that uh, 
in a way, um, if you look at how different Berlin looks today compared to when this campus started, um, it could, uh, some have argued that the impact of this initiative for Berlin itself has been quite limited. Um, the, uh, the campus has become quite po prominent and popular, but not because it really achieved a broader change in the energy infrastructure or energy technology for Berlin, which was its, which has been its value proposition. But really, it's become prominent as a model of innovation, as a campus model. So right now, um, there, is, it, there are and were initiatives underway to transfer this campus mode model, the UREF model, to other places in Germany, but primarily as a way of organizing innovation, as a kind of co-creative, as a, as a living, living lab to stimulate innovation and economic activity. And so while, while one could argue that it has failed to be a living lab for energy transition, it has succeeded to become a reference point for innovation, which is, and, and, which is interesting and in that the, the idea of scalability and transfer, transferability no longer really applies to the technologies that come out of that, but really to the idea of innovation per se, of how innovation is orchestrated. can say more about this um, in a second or later in the Q&A. Now, briefly and probably more briefly than this other case, here's here are some snapshots of the second case study. Um, EAA, the Energy Avant-Garde Anhalt. Um, Anhalt is a, uh, so this is a rural renewable energy network um, launched in 2014 in response to what the locals perceived as a lack of tangible results from the federal level energy transition, the Energiewende initiative um, for regional policies and regional transitions. And at the heart of this initiative is sort of a vision of uh, local production and consumption of energy, integration of electricity, heat and mobility. Um, and interestingly, the region's share in renewables was already uh, at 50% prior to launching this initiative even. Um, so what kind of society are we testing here? Quite different from the rural, uh, quite, quite different from the, uh, from the urban, uh, the, from the urban cosmopolitan Berlin. So it's one that is located in, um, one of the relatively speaking poorest and politically most disillusioned regions of Germany in the former East in Saxony Anhalt. It's a decentralized vision of energy self-sufficiency with a focus on individual needs and individual decisions and engagement. Um, it's uh, to a certain extent disappointment driven towards uh, with the to disappointments towards the federal government and it's very mundane. So caring more about, uh, well, some, a, a spectrum of high to low tech, including things as simple as heat pumps and smart meters, rather than sort of the future of mobility as integrated with um, urban campuses. Again, so how, how do this, these three tensions help us understand what's going on? Um, so if you think, so this is a large area, um, it's three and a half thousand square kilometers with about, with more than a quarter million inhabitants that are part of this energy uh, that fit in, uh, into this um, part of Anhalt that is, uh, that is under consideration for this living lab. So it's, um, it's not a fenced off area. It's quite, uh, it's quite fluid. Um, it's a sizable part of a federal state. It's, um, it's not fenced. Uh, well, it, um, it's hard to define where the boundaries are. Um, it's a di very different process of this, of getting in and out and deciding who's in and who's out. So it's more part of daily living environments of people who uh, of an entire region. And it was organized as a nonprofit or association um, where at least everybody could, be, uh, in theory, everybody could become part of. So individual citizens could be formally represented alongside organized interests such as companies and government. And in a way, it's uh, it was envisioned as a more bottom-up and participatory initiative. But yet again, there are some complications. One thing we observed is that despite these very good intentions of an uh, of an open bottom-up. Uh, more uh, more pervasive kind of network approach. Only very few citizens actually joined the association, and very quickly, um, the core group uh, determining the the uh, the fate of the of the project or of the of the initiative consisted um, primarily of experts and professionals 
from organizations such as public utility companies and municipalities and research institutions or even federal agencies. So again, there's sort of a, a there's a, a quite exclusive group um, who injected itself more forcefully into this. Um, there was in, partly related to that, there was a sort of divergent vision emerging between on the one hand, a um, sort of this open bottom up fluid open ended process and a more manageable project, what you might call a manageable project. Um, and uh, so these tensions grew over time. Um, they were partly reflected in diverging understandings of what this living lab or this uh, this living lab EAA Energy Avantgarde Anhalt was there to do was for. Um, so there was divergent understandings of what they are supposed to be an avant-garde for, a vanguard for, and what the risk, uh, what what, what the, this meant in terms of expectation towards the project. So from a federal perspective or from a government perspective um, this uh, this initiative was supposed to be a um, a national beacon project for energy transitions and rural revit revitalization it's sort of a demonstration of the viability feasibility and acceptance of transitions um, within rural contexts had a strong economic aspect meaning sort of emphasis on local solar production and it's sort of a small scale, stand in for transition challenges, economic transition challenges in, in weak rural areas in Germany and Europe at large. So in a way for from a from a I would say let's put it like a from a Berlin perspective, what this initiative stands for, it doesn't uh, the cultural specifics didn't matter, the socioeconomic conditions did because it's it's something envisioned uh, that, that as, as was envisioned as, as the stand-in that could provide a future or a solution for similar regions elsewhere in Germany and in the world. The local perspective differed quite strongly from that. Um, the local perspective from the beginning emphasized sort of local meaning, cultural embeddedness, and no ambitions to scale whatsoever. Um, more something closer to the citizens and self-sufficiency was tied to a sense of regional pride um, and a narrative of exceptionalism for the region. So the region of Anhalt um, has, has an identity as a, um, as a vanguard region. It was the cradle of the Reformation. So the city of Wittenberg is in there. Um, so cradle partly of enlightenment. It had the Bauhaus avant-garde and uh, partly associated with it in Dessau. And so there, there, is, uh, there is a self-conscious understanding that the region has provided important impulses for, uh, for, for changes, for transformations, uh, and that any new initiative would have to tap into these specifics in order to make sense locally. Uh, so uh, they needed this local backing and the local identity. Um, and there was, uh, as a result, a growing conflict of whose future are we actually talking about? Are we talking about the future of any um, any socioeconomically weak uh, region, rural region vis-a-vis -vis Berlin, or are we talking about specific regions who want to continue their identity? And in the in the medium run, or in the in the end, what this led to is a kind of split between a local and a national part of this initiative. So there's a national headquarter in Berlin, and sort of a local chapter, and um, quite quite uh, quite frequently these two were at odds with each other. So these are two, um, in a way, two case studies, and I don't need, I don't want to really summarize what I just said again. But uh, what I, what I would point out is that uh, we can understand um, a lot of what's going on in terms of technology integration by looking at what kind of societies are actually envisioned, how they deal with ideas of spatial confinement, of what the what the laboratory is, um, ideas of experimental governance. I didn't say as much about that. We can talk about this later. Um, tension uh, and kind of what I call characteristic tensions or productive tensions that actors locally work out, need to work out or uh, deal with uh, and that they find answers to um, in order to give this, uh, give this sort of specific flavor of what they are, um, uh, what, what they are, uh, what these living lab initiatives are trying to do. All right, so allow me to now start zooming out again um, from the specifics of the case studies, trying to ask again a few broader questions of how they relate to a research agenda about 
uh, about living labs and test bed. Um, so first of all, um, I think it's given what I said already. Um, I think there is some. Uh, it's clear that there are some interesting governance challenges or responsibility challenges associated with that. Uh, with this phenomenon at large, specifically with the cases that I talked about, but I, much beyond that as well. Um, so, uh, it, first of all, it raises um, it raises the questions uh, of controlled experimentation versus demo, demo, more democratic approaches of um, co-creation, and points to sort of standard questions of politics of inclusion. So, who is involved um, in shaping these initiatives? Who should be involved, maybe, and how? Um, and what we saw is that while all, while both of the cases that I talked about were open and sort of co-creatively interactive in some ways, they also developed their own ways of exclusion and partly reiterated old divides. So they became kind of instruments that re reinforced certain old divides. Um, and uh, for example, through this fencing off of the campus or the power asymmetries between the different groups in the EAA. Um, we what we also can ask is uh, to what extent are la labs or test beds really tests um is there any indication that the that there are negative uh, that that negative experiences have led to a rethinking of whether this is the right way forward in the first place um and so in a way in both our cases this idea of just testing technology tended to quickly recede into the background. And what was more important, or what was quickly more important was the performative function of materializing certain visions, like who gets to materialize a, a, so, a mostly economic or socioeconomic vision of how um, Germany needs to be transformed. Um, there were in no cases criteria expressed for what a failed, test bed or failed living that might look like. Um, and um, by extension, no, so we, in this cases and in many other cases, or actually in all cases that I'm aware of, there's sort of no idea of rolling back um, and taking this testing seriously. So this raises a very important question as to, um, again, who gets to make the decisions, which kind of investments are being put there, who gets to shape uh, into these initiatives, who gets to shape the decisions about their future and so on. Um, and occasionally what we saw uh, regularly was what we see is that corporate interests um, or in organized interests um, tend to be more apt at reorganizing power structures around their own um, interests. Now, there are a couple of interesting questions on uh, legal questions um, that we're currently working on. This is more work in progress. Um, so if we take the value proposition of living labs and test beds seriously um, and that take them as experiments that commit the public to new forms of living and working uh, through new technology, however tentatively, and also expose them partly to new risks, um, then we might want to ask, want, we might want to ask, um, to what extent are these not only experiments in society, but uh, experiments with or even on society? And the, the crux of that might, might not be as pressing or uh, urgent in questions of solar panels or heat pumps. But if you think about AVs or robots or genetically modified mosquitoes, they, they certainly are. Um, and so interesting or well, important questions that uh, that should uh, that these initiatives prompt are uh, questions of legal protection, consent and risk. So what kinds of forms, uh, how, uh, how do citizens consent or not consent to be part of these initiatives? What wider forms of legal recourse do citizens have if they do not like what's going on, either as the experiment um, and the experimental mode or the types of technologies that they produce? Who decides who's in and out? Um, can collectives decide? Do individuals decide? Do collectives decide? Is it an opt-in versus an opt-out regime? Um, so these are a number of interesting questions, and uh, this is sort of work in progress. But one thing, uh, the, uh, one thing that we tend to observe is that they basically deal with questions of consent and legal protection in three different ways. 
um, one that's more associated with what we might call scientific consent, similar to medical studies. Um, so informed consent, for example, if you put robots in a hospital, infrastructural consent, where it's more about um, impact assessment and standing and sort of more representative forms or democratic forms of consent um, that have more to do with how uh, how and uh, how elected representatives, politicians, and parliaments deliberate about these kinds of things. Um, and there, I mean, this is work in progress. I don't have much to say about it, but there's a sort of slippery slope that many of the these test beds are proposed and justified through what we might call scientific logic. So we need to experiment scientifically, but really the the recourse gets dragged into um, much more uh, much much more into this democratic representative um, domain assuming that uh, which forces people to uh, or which not just people to assume that somehow politics will take care of the safety of this and the individualized consent is sort of um, left aside all right um, I'm not going to talk about this again but obviously there are many other cases that we can talk about the last point I would like to make um, in this presentation is uh, one about scale and scalability and the politics of scaling and here maybe it's important to recognize um, that these living labs are um, as i said at the beginning they come with a value proposition that has intrinsically to do with uh, scalability and transferability meaning um, very often they are envisioned as blueprints for broader social technical te technical changes that could be applied in other cities and other uh, in other countries around the world, including with business models that companies are trying to develop, I don't know, digital technologies that then can be rolled out elsewhere. But this is part of um, what I would argue to be a broader trend towards scale and scalability, where these questions of scale and scalability have really moved to the center of current innovation discourses and with them social and political life. And um, we might think of questions of scale most readily at the moment in terms of um, big tech, new digital platform economies, so Facebook, Twitter, Uber, Airbnb, which have amassed sort of hundreds of millions of users within a few years. So this is where this question of scale is really most pressing. But in a way, um, the uh, living labs and test beds are not that dissimilar from, from that because they also have this built-in idea of broad societal transformation. And it's uh, interestingly, this, this language of scale is also, it's not just in the private sector and in tech entrepreneurship, it's also increasingly in policymaking towards grand societal challenges that we need to address, um, or scalable living labs, or mission-driven innovation, or entrepreneurial statehood, and so on. So how, how do we... Uh, how do we, the language of innovation in, in policy domains is very ce centrally driven around this, how do we get from an innovation to a, I don't know, climate change mitigation or social transformation at large. Um, and this raises all kinds of problems in question that we partly um, touched on already. So what happens if societal questions are framed as problems of scale and scalable transformations? Um, what happens to so solutions or um, what happens if we have to frame solutions as scalable solutions? How is power reconfigured through this kind of um, shift? How do we deal with an innovation landscape that relies on sort of blitz scaling and monopoly profits? And what kind of expertise or techniques um, are enrolled into questions of scale? And this, in a way, um, puts the focus also on, uh, on the lessons that we learn or the things that we see at Living Labs um in in the way that they try to stabilize at this kind of intermediate level um transformations that are then deemed as workable feasible desirable and so on so it's somehow in the middle and trying to stabilize something and what we can learn from living labs and also draw a comparison to this is sort of a paper that's in the may or it's about to come out in Social Studies of Science, together with colleagues, um, Brice Laurent, um, as Alexandre mentioned before, uh, Jack Stilgo, Kiriaki Papageogiu. Um, so we look at these politics of scaling, we look at test beds also on other sites, um, as, as initiatives that, that combine patterns of tech solutionism, so 
um, finding technological solutions by through very specific artificially narrowed problem definitions in a sort of tech fix per sense questions of experimentalism that we talked about a lot today um, so what does this mean and the tensions and questions of financialization so what kind of new valuation practices or assetization practices relate to questions of scalability um, and how does this tap into entrepreneurial logics and new redefinitions of the public good all right with that um, let me thank you for your attention um, i hope this was interesting to you i hope this said uh, this uh, this connects to some of the issues that you are working on um, that um, i'm very curious to hear the the links that you saw with your own work and so on and so on um, feel free to reach out about this work in particular but also about other ongoing work in our uh, in our group i put a number of publications that came out of this and are still forthcoming um, so the 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 one central publication around the, these case studies today is um, has come has come out in research policy i think a year and a bit ago um, there are a couple of other works um, together with other colleagues that relate to this um, uh, and there's one forthcoming paper on uh, on scalability issues uh, that touch upon living labs and experimentation as well with that um thanks a lot for your attention and i'm very happy to receive any questions you might have or comments or criticism of course um, all of that is very welcome thank you thank you for this presentation so uh, for, for the people uh, connected you can put your, your question in in the chat do not hesitate so we have a first question from uh, theodore kalpak schiff i'm sorry for that <laughs> How about the new European Bauhaus? It includes mod, uh, modularity of elements, potentially uh, artificial intelligence optimized, inclusive co-creation, etc. Would it have the potential to bridge testing and scaling up? Yeah, um, so uh, uh, interesting question, uh, Theodore. Thanks for asking it. Um, the So the and there's a number of interesting things in this question. Um, one is that apparently um, the ideas of avant-garde or sort of socially, industrially oriented types of housing or planning or design um, are kind of on vogue again. For me, what's more interesting in this is that somehow even here, the idea of socially relevant innovation is tied to questions of sort of European identity in a, in a way. So what does it mean um, to ask these questions under the label of Bauhaus? And why, why I mean, there, there seems, for me, there seems to be a, a broader desire to reframe innovation under the uh, under sort of regionally, locally specific headings. And I think this has a lot to do with uh, positioning work of sort of Europe, Europe as an innovation space vis-a-vis -vis the United States, vis-a-vis -vis Asia, for example. Um, so I, again, from a from research perspective, it's interesting to ask, uh, first of all, what do we gain or why do people turn to Bauhaus as something specifically European beyond just mere branding? And what, what kind of ideas of, a social, of social change does this actually evoke? Um, I do, there is a lot of this, is intermingled with, as you said, idea, certain ideas about innovation, inclusive co-creation, scalability, modularity, and so on. And I think this, this ties very much into the idea of what living labs have become. I mean, there's every so many years, there's a little bit of uh, vocabulary repackaging going on um, and finding the next trend and the next fancy name for, uh, for uh, why we need more innovation. But um, the, um, in a way, um, you're right that this initiative, um, at least to a certain extent, builds on ideas of uh, modularity and scalability and sort of an industrial mode of pro an industrialized mode of producing socially desirable kinds of innovation and, and artifacts. There is also sort of um, again there's sort of an uh, allusion to. Um, to a manufacturing tradition and sort of sort of more locally grounded ways of doing things. 
Uh, but uh, so the the short answer is yes. I'm not going to give give a prediction as to whether this is going to be successful or not successful. But the uh, what's interesting is that it exactly taps into these dynamics of experimentation, um, modularization, innovation as a solution for social challenges, and so on. Thank you. Thank you for this answer. And uh, I think I, I have a question not so far from this question, from this point. You say that uh, the, the, when you speak about the campus in, in Berlin, the campus about innovation, uh, I wanted to know if you think that uh, the, the possibility to have this kind of, uh, of, uh, of place for innovation around of the question of the campus in the cities is a particular uh, culture of global cities. So, uh, because you say the case of the case of the river for the second case, there is not a specific uh, cultural point in in the in in the implementation of uh, of this uh, of this innovation uh, center side of the side of the cities. But I wanted to know if we can say that inside global cities we can find a, a culture of innovation in narrative, perhaps, a culture of innovation in cities? And if yes, uh, the campus is perhaps the image of that? Yeah, um, excellent question. Uh, really, let me say one thing. Before I answer this question, let me say one other thing. So for the for the rural campus, um, it's not that the, uh, I, mean, I, I think what I tried to say is that there is a lot of identity and cultural specificity, but it's something that at least from a planning perspective or from a federal government perspective, it's not recognized as such. And that's where the tension came from. Um, so the, the specific, the tension was precisely because local actors saw this as something idiosyncratic, something very specific to their region. Whereas the, uh, from a top-down perspective, it looked very, I mean, not unsurprisingly, it looked very much like a stand-in for just social economic change. But to your question about global cities, I think you're, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, so, uh, I mean, part, partly building on the literature of sort of globalized cities, of course, and sort of innovation cities, I think there is a certain, uh, and right, we are, we, at least among policymakers and mainstream writing, there is consensus that uh, that there that what constitutes a successful city in the twenty first century is somehow related to the question of being an innovation hub. Um, and then there's various ideas of what being an innovation hub means, but very often it has to do something with strong universities and research campuses and so on. So the whole, uh, triple triple helix, quadruple helix kind of stuff. Um, ideas of why we look to MIT and to Silicon Valley and these regions of uh, and, and or Singapore, Tel Aviv, and so on. Of how these things come together. Um, there is, uh, I mean, the, the literature on innovation in cities. Uh, things like Richard Florida, um, creative class, speaks to a specific way of how cities are being imagine that need to attract diverse um, diverse populations that need to attract sort of high uh, certain highly educated classes and so on and so on and why this is problematic and e even from mainstream innovation policy discourse there has been quite a lot of internal critique of what these visions do about new inequality about gentrification about the about the shape of cities now what um, to your uh, I mean, in your question of is there something that is specifically related to global cities? I think absolutely yes. Um, these are sort of ob almost obligatory passage points. In a way, many cities are trying to have these um, specific districts as, as showcases um, to show their um, technology promiscuity, their ability to transform, um, sometimes to the extent of this being entire cities. I mean, Singapore is one example. Uh, where this happens quite a lot, um, it's also to do. It's also got to do with the typical questions of connectivity and agglomeration, um, and sort of, uh, yeah, global visibility. For me, um, and this now relates to other projects that uh, that I'm currently working on that have more to do with regions rather than cities per se. Um, this is very interesting from a sort of regional policy development perspective, and that it tends to reinforce per div divides um, where the only where it, 
basically if you are a city the only way to put yourself on the global map is by being active in the innovation space and having like a fancy campus like that and having the companies and having the googles of the world and the uh, and so on sort of invest investing in research activity so in a way what you can observe i think and that's quite interesting is that you have a lot of smaller cities or regions uh, sort of lost regions um, regions with industrial decline and so on throwing themselves at these models at these companies and saying look why don't you use um, upstate new york the rust belt or why don't you use former coal regions in uh, in germany or even in france or why how do you revitalize and the go-to answer very much at these days is innovation so the, the revitalization so and, and very often trans, uh, innovation as an answer to how to write, revitalize regions translates into these sort of campus initiatives or research center initiatives so there is something specific about having a claiming your spot claiming your seat at the global table um, by investing in these kinds of initiatives uh, as you see in berlin in this in this campus but uh, again sort of berlin is also i mean berlin is what it is it's it's a big city with its with a very specific identity and it's hard to it's hard to generalize from berlin as it's as hard to generalize from berlin as it would be to generalize from paris but the um uh, in a way, the, the general direction which you're pointing um, is quite important, and I, I think that that's absolutely that's absolutely right. Thank you, thank you for this answer. And, and if I, I I can continue on this topic, do, do you think that um, we, we can say that the, the innovation innovation is is a is a way of a spatial fix? Because you you speak about the tech fix, so the possibility to have. A, uh, a technological fix, as as uh, uh, David Harvey explained in in his geography of the domination of capitalism. So what I want to say is, uh, uh, ca can we say that a campus like the innovation is a way to uh, uh, fix the capital the capital in inside cities and, and not to 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 expand the, the the innovation outside of these global cities? So I, I come back on the question of global cities. So. There is, there is a monopole of uh, innovation in, in global cities or, or, or it is more diffuse as we can imagine. So um, yeah. the, the special fix of David Harvey was to say that in the, in the expansion of the cities, we are in obligation in the capitalism to, to fix the capital inside buildings or inside services. And we can say that the campus of innovation have two special, special fix. There is the buildings of the, the campus, and at the same time, there is the services like uh, the uh, high uh, employment, uh, uh, the high uh, uh, employees, uh, the high educated employees. Sorry, and uh, and uh, and the, the technical innovation or technological innovation, for example, uh, uh, charging point inside cities and not outside of the cities. So we continue to concentrate the, with different with different on form and by the uh, through the question of the, the innovation do you think that the process process is a, of innovation yeah. in campus is, is, is a concentration process so there are a number of inter I, I I tend to agree with that although we see the limits of this uh, of these of this focus on concentration as well I mean the, the second case study that I presented this this rural initiative was precisely launched because they couldn't uh, they didn't see any value in the uh, in the way how this energy transition in Germany was implemented, focused on uh, primarily on urban regions, and there were was a lot of dis disillusionment and, dis uh, and disappointment uh, with these initiatives. And uh, in I guess definitely in Germany, I don't know as much about France, uh, but in Germany and other regions, you have currently a um, uh, a trend towards uh, digital digital villages and sort of uh, so you have the you have the counter movements as much as you have the movements and the, I think this taps into a broader spirit of disappointment towards the promises of innovation, a sort of a, a disillusionment with the with the with this with the promise of innovation that promised us all kinds of things and what it led to is uh, uber and more disenfranchisement. And so that you have you have the pendulum swinging back, and I think it, there's more narrative work to be done to justify just innovation for innovation's sake. So that's a general observation. But that said, I do agree that um, in a way these campuses and the global cities um, are still the focus point and the concentration point. And if anything, 
for me, it might get. Um, I mean, I, I'm an optimist, and I'm. I would. Uh, I. I definitely root for rural regions, but I see massive concentrations in in certain cities and the haves and have-nots. Uh, Munich is one place where it's, it's just going through the roof at the moment, um, the, economically speaking. Um, there is. Uh, I really like what you pointed about sort of the spatial fix and what this might mean. For me, it's really interesting to think about the spatial dimension of um, of innovation, and that there seems to be um, really in the narrative of innovators um, increasingly this very explicit link to um, innovation needs to be done in a space in a in an, in an area in a spatially defined area, usually a city. So we focus on transformation of mobility, transformation of energy, transformation of digital services, and so on, primarily in the, con in the con concentration of cities. But the argument that in order to develop these new technologies and these new business models, we already need to experiment with cities and with, with populations, that is uh, the, the degree to which this has become a standard trope. This is really, I think this is different from before and, and new. So, I mean, the urban planning has always happened uh, and experimentation has always happened. But the, uh, the, the fact that many, nobody will talk about the future of mobility in AV without also including a city administration or a local quarter. They just don't, they don't do that. The whole, the, the proliferation of smart city initiatives around the world, like, it's all sort of in in the idea how we think innovation at the moment. It's always in, it's very often in conjunction with cities as already willing partners to offer public space and public resources and maybe even entire populations to the disposal at the disposal of innovate innovators, whatever that means. And uh, I think there's a general this this is a trend and it's a disconcerting trend. And I'm um, yeah, it's I, I guess one of the bigger challenges that we need to come to terms with as researchers and but also as societies. I mean, I, it, yes, just look. looking at Munich, there's like, I can probably name from the top of my head 50 supposed living labs even within the city of Munich. So what does that, and all of them somehow involve Technical University of Munich. So what does, what does that mean if it's really that kind of concentration? And you can probably, in Paris, there's probably 2000 living labs of some sort um, and they all sometimes uh, they tend to involve similar types of actors all the time. Yes, absolutely. And I, I think Brice, Brice Laurent, the professor Brice Laurent from uh, Paris Tech University was, was saying in the first webinar about uh, urban experiments that uh, we, we can see that there is living labs, there is smart cities, so very uh, easy to, to understand because it's, uh, the perimeter is, uh, is de defined in the beginning of the experimentation, but with some have some experimentation that is for all the city, like the autonomous driving or the, 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 the new mobility system, like the easy scooter in, in Paris we talk a lot about this question so uh, the, the limit of the experimentation uh, is, is, is another point I think and we can have a concentration of the innovation in the conception of the city like in a smart city but we can have the experimentation of how one technological object can be integrated in the city so this is two, two different points but I think on this question it can be interesting to, to say that the, the, that for that for the, the narrative of the today today uh, through uh, experimental city there is an obligation to have a concentration of capital uh, because we, we can have another point about experimentation is how people use public space or use uh, a technological object in the street and they are uh, making experimentation but without uh, 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 limit uh, limitation or without a legal uh, uh, context so we, we can have an experimentation do make by by inhabitants without uh, the the volunty the, the the will to 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 make the experimentation and in another Another side, we have private sector who have a lot of capital and who try to make an experimentation by the conception of the city or by a conception of a technological technological object. But in order to to make profit, there is two there is two two experimentation experimentations experimentation in the in the commercial point and the experimentation that 
everybody do uh, by uh, using the public space or a technological object without the the yeah. will to to notation so, notation so what do you think about the two two elements are can can we speak in the two case of experimentation or uh, the experimentation is necessarily something that uh, the actor or the will will to do um, yeah i think you're pointing to something important i know i mean please and i please do i have been talking about this for a while as well um so the uh, i think that uh, the experimentation itself is becoming um, more and more on vogue, um, I think across a number of domains, um, business model, uh, inno innovate technology innovation, urban plan. So experimentation is kind of a go-to thing, and I think maybe implicitly it has been for a long while. And every kind of historically speaking, every kind of technology that was introduced to society can be seen as a kind of experiment. But the fact that it's so ex explicit today, um, is, for me, changes something. You're right that many of the initiatives that you see, there is sort of a confluence of, well, this technological experimentation, like putting together an algorithm or a, a device combined with um, a business model experimentation. Is there actually a way how somebody can make money out of it, that you, uh, which then also goes about the performative dimension of social experimentation? So, do we find a group that we can attach that is willing to attach itself or to allow the introduction of a device and its proposed business model into their regular social uh, into their social uh, life um, into their environment so this is um do we if we dis designate a space in which people accept e-scooters um and the financial business model behind e-scooters does this create enough of a path, path dependency and a lock-in so that we can that we can then sort of scale outward from there both in the business model but also in this uh, in, sort of in the redesign model so all of this is um i th so yes i think there are different layers of experimentation that that link into one another there are um i would i mean what's partly interesting is also to think about how this relates to the notion of territoriality in the first place so what um, you said what do cities need to do? Where are the spaces within cities, whether it's uh, quartier um, or quarters or whether it's the city as itself? Is it a smart city? And where do these technologies go? What are, what, what are the envisioned boundaries? What are test populations? There is something about um, re-envisioning regionality or regions or cities at the level, at the scale for which it becomes useful for innovation, I think that's uh, there's sort of. Uh, I think that's that's quite interesting, and it's uh, re envisioning identities or communities that matter at the level for which they can serve the purposes of innovation and certain business models. So there's sort of new divide boundaries being drawn around this, and you can think of. Um, I don't know, um, AV testing on privately owned ground, aut autonomous vehicle testing on privately own owned ground, or around micro smart grids, which are more like city neighborhoods. Um, so so all, all these things operate at different scales. So the, que the question is, when you launch initiatives, who is the we and what, this, what does this then mean for questions of governance and political representation. So I spoke a little bit about sort of questions of consent and populations, but I think sort of questions of sort of how this fits with political scales and questions of subsidiarity is quite um, sort of are sort of downstream questions. So but that, I think that's sort of, lo there's a lot to explore going forward. <laughs> I don't have all the answers for it. <laughs> So, so th thank you for this answer. I, I think there is no other question, and uh, we will uh, we will finish on this on this point. Thank you, Professor Fotenhauser, for for this presentation. It was very clear and very interesting for us. And uh, you 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 are the, the last one for this year for this uh, uh, webinar on urban experiments. We we would like to continue next year after September. So thank you um, um, to have accepted this invitation and uh, have a have a good day uh, in in Munich.
Thank you. Um, have a good day and a safe opening up of the lockdown in Paris as of tomorrow. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you for the question. Looking forward to continuing it in the future. Yes, I hope to. Have a good weekend and good long weekend for everybody. Thank you. Bye.